Some psychedelic drugs induce mystical experiences which give people a sense of a much wider and more intense and encompassing form of love than any they've known in the more limited human realm. Love is all you need, says the song. From the Christian tenet, God is love, to the plots of countless novels and films, love is seen as central to our lives. Yet from scientific studies, along with anecdotal accounts, we know that psychoactive substances and MDMA in particular can enhance and even induce intense feelings of love. If love can be hacked by a change in brain chemistry, might our romanticized idea of love itself be the distortion? Should we use drugs to encourage, initiate, and repair relationships, as some therapists advocate, or are such experiences false, damaging, and potentially socially dangerous? Is love a product of brain chemistry, or is it something deeper than a drug could ever replicate? So, on to our speakers. Anders Sandberg is a philosopher and research fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford. He describes himself as an academic jack of all trades. Ella Whelan is a political commentator and freelance journalist and author of What Women Want, Fun, Freedom and An End to Feminism. Rupert Sheldrake is a biologist, author, and researcher. Rupert is author of books like The Science Delusion and Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for being here. Um, we're gonna kick off with a three minute pitch. That means you have three minutes to lay out your position on the question of should we use drugs to initiate, encourage, or repair love, Rupert? Oh, I didn't know I was going first. I thought I was going last. Um, <laughs> I was just relaxing and waiting to hear what they said. <laughs> Do you said. need a minute? <laughs> all right. Um, well, first of all, I don't think love's just romantic love. It's obvious there's many kinds. I'm a biologist. And if you think about the way in which mother animals will protect their young, most of us would think of that as a form of love. I certainly would. And in the human realm, romantic love is obviously one kind. But also parental love uh, is another, and there are many other forms of love in our society, the love between friends and so on. Um, so love isn't just a feeling, uh, it's a kind of bond or connection between people which has effects. Uh, if you love somebody or care for them, look after them when they're sick, care about them, uh, and uh, it's what you do is actually more important than what you feel, of course, the feelings help the action, but we all know that a lot of people can talk about love in a way that sounds impressive, but when it comes to action, um, there are other people who don't talk about it who are actually much more loving. Um, so that's one point. Another point is that the, um, the Christian view of, of love and, and many other religious views of love is that we live ultimately in a universe where the ultimate consciousness that on which all our conscious minds depend is basically loving. Even though terrible things happen in the world, there's something loving about ultimate reality. And this is something many people experience through mystical experiences. Many people have the experience of being in the loving presence of a greater consciousness. And that can indeed be enhanced by drugs. Some psychedelic drugs induce mystical experiences which give people a sense of a much wider and more intense and encompassing form of love than any they've known in the more limited human realm, a kind of ultimate source of love. And that can lead to a sense of connection with nature and with other people that does lead to more loving relationships. In relation to repairing relationships, I do think drugs can have a beneficial effect. When I first took MDMA, it was in the early 1980s in California, when it had just been uh, developed by Sasha Shulgin and was being tried out by small groups of psychotherapists who were convinced it would have this effect of enabling people to respond to people they were in tense relationships with without lessening their fear, enabling a greater honesty in a way that could help repair relationships. 
It was utterly surprising to me that this became a kind of dance drug and part of rave culture. When it was first uh, used, it was not part of, that simply wasn't on the horizon. It was, it was seen much more in a therapeutic setting. And interestingly, we're now coming back to the use of psychedelics and mind-altering substances like MDMA um, in the context of psychotherapy and repairing damaged relationships within families um, and between people. So I think drugs can enhance this uh, by reducing fear, by opening us up to a greater sense of conscious presence, a loving presence. Um, but I don't think love's all about altered brain chemistry. I think it's a much more fundamental feature of the universe and of animal behavior. Thank you so much. Anders, over to you. Should we use drugs to initiate, encourage, or repair love? So I wrote an ethics paper uh, about this, one of the early ethics papers. And then you find that uh, as an academic, you just struck gold because everybody wants to debate it. So it became a whole sequence of papers. and. When I started thinking about it, I noticed that it seems that we have three kinds of love-related systems in the brain. One is basically the sex system, mating with somebody that you can mate with. Then you have an attraction system, finding somebody that you're compatible with. And then there is the pair bonding system. And they seem to have slightly different neurochemical substrates. And you could imagine drugs or other means that enhance different, them to different levels. So I think the sex part we can leave aside for the time being, uh, although that's kind of the fun part. But the nice thing about the attraction system is, of course, okay, when you fall in love, you feel something extremely intense, something extremely pleasurable. But it's also problematic if you could make people fall in love. The love potion we have in fairy tales and other stories would be pretty horrifying if, if it actually existed in the real world. If I'm in love with somebody only because I got a particular drug, that seems to be deeply inauthentic. That seems to be, from a moral standpoint, totally problematic. On the other hand, once you have established that you're compatible with somebody, you start to grow together. It's a learning process. That initial burst of dopamine and other things is telling our forebrains to learn everything we can about each other. We start developing habits, friendships, and uh, the things that is actually sustainable, not just through a few months of a passion, uh, passionate effort, but instead over years, staying together. And that pair bonding system, the interesting part is evolution has obviously optimized us for staying together long enough to rear our kids. But then we might want as humans to stay together much longer than the, the kids are around because we actually now appreciate that bond. Unfortunately, evolution might not have optimized that that bond stays long enough. Indeed, in our evolution of evolutionary adaptation, we might generally not have expected to survive that long. So this is where we might validly say we might want to help that system. There might be hints here that the, the hormones oxytocin and vasopressin are used as neuromodulators in the brain, and there might be ways here of using that to strengthen the pair body. This is where we get links to MDMA, which also affects the oxytocin system. And this is where I think we have a pretty clear moral case that, yeah, if we have couples that want to stay together, of obviously couples therapy works, but we might want to enhance that as much as possible. So I do think that, yes, there are drugs that definitely can help love and also allow us to have authentic love. There might be other situations when they would be totally inappropriate, but I think there is a good chance. The real problem we have, however, we haven't developed the drugs really well. Right now we have a few examples of drugs that have been discovered, but nobody has really worked hard on making the best love drugs, the best ones for therapy, the best ones for actually helping authentic love. So we're kind of stumbling around with the molecules we happen to know about. Thank you very much. Ella, over to you. Should we use drugs to initiate encourage or repair love well so i mean you know the idea of artificial it's already been touched upon that the idea of artificial love or inducing love artificially is nothing new and you just have to go back you know through literature and culture the ancient greeks had eros with his arrows and you know stories like tristan and his old um people shortcutting the barriers that they might face in their way, whether it be geography or social status or someone not fancying you and shortcutting that with some kind of love potion or some kind of God with you know favor on your side doing it for you. 
But they, you know, across the years and the centuries, they all have one thing in common is that they all end in disaster. They all end in death, tragedy, destruction, um, someone finding out. And, you know, as, as Anders has said, you know, the immorality of forcing um, love on someone through artificial means is quite obvious. Um, but I think the thing I want to sort of investigate across the hour we have is that, you know, the reason why this happens is not just because it's immoral to make someone um, love you when they don't or you're not sure about it, but because love is not a simple thing that you can shortcut. You can't hack it. Um, it's neither simple and it's neither an isolated experience. I think probably this is the biggest issue I have with the idea of um, drugs individually being used to induce some kind of feeling of love is that for me, whether it's as um, Rupert's talked about, familial love, re friendship love, romantic love, uh, the important thing is that it's not an isolated experience. You, you know, it takes two to tango. You have to have someone else to um, experience that with you and to deepen the understanding of it. The very human nature of the idea of love is that it's a social thing. Um, and I'm incredibly skeptical and disheartened today with the folk, contemporary focus on things like self-care, self-love. And, you know, that's not to say I don't put on a face pack and a crappy movie of myself sometimes and indulge in whatever the hell it is. But this idea that the true meaning of love is to be found within yourself, in your individual life, and that that sort of should be enough for you. And then maybe if you end up in bed with someone or married to someone, you know, that's just a bonus. Um, and obviously I've got nothing against drugs per se, you know, if the two of you want to go out into the hills and take a few mushrooms and roll around together and tell each other that you love each other, that's fine. And that's, you know, I'm, I hope you have a good time. Um, and, and, you know, lots of people do it. And there's, there's really, I don't see anything wrong with that in general. <clears throat> but I just can't get on board with the idea that that means something substantial if we're talking about, you know, philosophically or morally or universally what the idea of love should be or an aspiration of what love should be because i think the key thing is that love is and this is perhaps something that no one has said yet is that love is not one dimensional the power of love it has to include within it pain and death and destruction you know the reason why that moment when you're first falling in love with someone or you first meet a friend is so sweet is because half of you is always worried that they're not, they don't love you back or that it, you might not be enough. And that's kind of what drives you forward. And that's the thing that keeps you waiting by the phone. And obviously when you, if you do end up with someone romantically and you are going to be with them for the rest of the li your life, there's that human biological clock ticking in the back of your head that says one day one of us is gonna die. And that's the tragedy of love, which is that it all is always going to end in loss in one way or another. Um, and that's part of what makes it so powerful. You can't have true love in whatever form it takes, you know, between friends and family or lovers without the understanding that it also contains deep and visceral pain. Um, and so I think, you know, any kind of artificial means of trying to explore that through drugs, taking a pill or a potion or something um, to, in order to feel that pleasure is leaving out the important pain bit. And I was sort of, you know, you can, I was looking for a good Shakespeare quote, trying to find something to capture it. You know, the man who wrote so much about love. And I came across this one from, you know, love is a smoke and is made with the fume of sighs. No, you know, no bonus points for understanding that's from Romeo and Juliet, one of the most famous love stories ever written. And I picked it because of fume. I thought maybe that would be relevant to a discussion about drugs. But then, you know, encapsulating this idea that, you know, yes, love is a drug. Yes, it makes us do, it is, the pursuit of it is something that is meant to be centrally around pleasure. But actually, it is also uh, the human thing about it is that it is so complicated. It is so entwined with that other dark side of us, which is jealousy and sometimes terrible things like murder and pain. And that's what makes love this thing that we keep driving after. Otherwise, we'd all sit in our rooms, take drugs and do it to ourselves. And I think that's probably not a good future to look forward to. Thank you. Thank you to our panelists for those opening pitches. I want to pick up where uh, Ella just left us, actually. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.